everybody, welcome to the fifth and final video in my top 50 favorite games of all time series. Today we're gonna to be counting down number 10 down to number one. I'll have some kind of final thoughts and rambly nonsense after the number one game. Uh, let's go ahead and then just jump right into the number 10 game. And this is Warhammer Quest Blackstone Fortress. This is a pretty new game. Came out at the end of last year-ish. Uh, was my favorite game from last year. Uh, I've been a big fan of the new Warhammer Quest games. I think you can see a couple of them here. I still have the Silver Tower and Shadows Over Hammerhall game there. I really enjoy those too. Uh, this one though came along and just sort of slaughtered those games. Uh, now the system in the Blackstone Fortress is pretty much the same ballpark as the system in these two uh, earlier editions. But this kind of really just jacks up uh, the intensity and the level of gameplay and the depth and just kind of the breadth and scope of the campaign that's actually in the box here. So if you're not familiar with it, it's sort of in the ballpark of claustrophobia, sort of. You have the kind of rolling dice and then you're kind of placing the dice on your little heroes as you kind of adventure through this Blackstone Fortress and taking different actions with those. And you have uh, destiny dice and things like that that are sort of a communal dice that the players will sort of collectively agree to spend on different things. And it's cooperative and you go through uh, a pretty large campaign in this case. And it's in the 40K universe and all that kind of stuff. And a couple of things that kind of just highlight for me. First off is the theme of it. And it's basically a dungeon crawl, but you're going through this fortress, which is sort of alive, and there's these weird different uh, minions in there, and none of them really have anything to do with uh, like the main quest that you're on to sort of unlock this hidden vault. But they're all kind of there doing it at the same time for their own reasons, or maybe they're just in the fortress because they've been trapped there. And there's a, there's a lot of extra little kind of weird things. So the setting of it is really cool. It's basically this huge, larger than you can imagine, uh, giant space station that's you know ancient, thousands and thousands of years old, and it's kind of kind of life of its own, and there's some chaos involved and all this kind of crazy stuff. So the setting and the environment just feels very alive, very vibrant. Um, and so that just kind of sucks me right in. Uh, if you've seen my video where I kind of tr uh, blinged out the actual game with some 3D printed pieces, and I've read the novel and stuff, I got really kind of sucked into the theme of this uh, game. Uh, so that's a very attractive kind of place to sort of play in. Now on the flip side of it, the mechanical side of it, it's very interesting because, like I said, it's kind of like claustrophobia with the dice thing, so that makes it the decision making a little bit more crunchy and interesting than just kind of like move four spaces, you know, do this, do this. You have some sort of uh, action selection type of dilemma, you know, that you have to do on your turn. But kind of in a more broader sense, the way that the campaign itself lays itself out is really neat. Now, it sort of hints at being a legacy game, but you don't actually tear anything up or remove anything out of the game permanently. And it doesn't advertise itself as a legacy game, but in the game, there's a deck of cards called the Legacy Deck. And so as you go through the game, there's all these different envelopes. So when you want to like stop playing a character or that character dies, you'll put their character card and any items and stuff that they have in there in what's called a stasis chamber, which is just some fancy envelope with some cool art and things on it. And then, so if you want to just drop out and play different characters or if a character dies, it's not like you're dead, but that character is dead unless you, you know, do a really kind of random thing to try to revive them, which is kind of difficult, but you can revive them, but mostly they're dead. And so, so the death is real. It's a very, you know, it has an impactful, uh, you know, outcome and, and everything on the game. But that doesn't mean that Billy, who was playing that character, is then out of the game. They just fire up another stasis chamber and pull that character out of a cryo freeze or whatever, and then they can keep playing that character. And there's also sort of a stasis chamber for kind of saving your campaign and things like that. And so as you kind of evolve through the game, it it starts to add in you know, new bad characters and things like that and that are more powerful that you have to deal with. And then as you go through and sort of collect uh, these, these different artifacts and things, then you start to unlock these different uh, you know, larger, uh, more epic, more scary campaign scenarios. And finally, then you get to the vault and then that's kind of your final battle. And so this is a campaign that you can actually lose the campaign and just be done. If you run out of time going through that legacy deck, then you've lost, you've got to start over. If you have enough characters die, you won't have enough to field uh, because you always field four characters. So if you have 
more than four characters die, you can only field three because there's eight in the box, then you know you run out of stuff to do. So uh, it's nice because even though you lose, you can still reset and play it again. But all the things that you do, they have it just adds this extra layer of drama onto it because as you sort of go on an adventure, the adventure is going to be a whole mix of things. It's going to be some, you know, moving around and fighting and stuff like a typical typical dungeon crawl. But on the other hand, some of the adventures that it's going to generate when you go on like a mission is going to be some minor choose your own adventure things, some little thematic twists and things. Think of like Tales of the Arabian Night type of things on cards. So you have like a little decision to make or a little mini game to play and stuff like that. So it's not just running through a dungeon and playing your combat cards and doing all that kind of stuff. There's some extra wacky little tidbits and things that are thrown in there. So as you progress through all of these different adventures on a, on a single session, you're going to be confronted with a lot of decisions of like, oh, do we retreat because, you know, uh, Janice, the Billy character, is going to die and we don't want that because he's got some cool stuff or, you know, we don't want another character to die. But we also don't want to just pull out and retreat at the end of this particular scenario we're in because that's going to help us or hurt us going through the legacy deck that much quicker and we haven't maybe gotten the things that we needed out of it. So because you have that sort of like doom hanging over your head, it's just something that's not really, you know, that present in a lot of these other campaign games. Uh, at least not like to the level in the way that they do this. And it's, it seems like such an obvious thing that could be done where it's like, yeah, you go through the campaign, but... Oh, well, okay, you lost, so just replay that scenario. Oh, you lost again, replay that scenario. Or you lost, well, just keep playing. It's not that big a deal. You're supposed to go through a campaign and get a narrative, and that's it. This is like, you can screw up big time, and then you can just blow the whole thing, Bobby. Uh, so that is just a really interesting aspect. So let's jump into the, some of the pillars. Uh, the uh, player count, uh, you're always going to play with four characters, uh, but you can play it, you know, one to four players. There is a, like a uh, game master mode, which is kind of, doesn't seem to really fit for me. They've come out with extra rules since the release of the game to make the dungeon master mode more of a, uh, you know, a little bit more engaging because it's kind of a, it feels honestly a little tacked on here and I've not ever used it because of that. Uh, but maybe you could play through that mode and maybe take turns playing that and there's some there's some rules in the box here for sort of scoring who did best and stuff because in the setting not the characters aren't really necessarily all buddies they might have ulterior motives and stuff so it'd be nice to see him flesh that out a little bit but I, it's not really the part of the game that interests me whatsoever i like it i was as it is it was just a co-op and straightforward thing so for me it's a one to four player game it doesn't matter um, if players drop out because if let's say we have four people playing and Billy can't make it and so if somebody just you know takes over the character Billy would play or pulls a different character out we're still always gonna have four characters uh, in the game even though there's you know maybe less than four players so that doesn't really matter now it's probably gonna add a little bit of play time because there's gonna be discussion and things whereas if you solo it you don't have to you don't have to run anything by anybody you can say I'm gonna activate this guy and do this so the play time is gonna go up a little bit but in terms of actual playtime, that's going to kind of vary because, like I said, when you go on a mission or do a session, you'll have kind of eight little adventures that you're going to go through. Now, if you go through all eight, and that's going to be like usually four combat missions and then four kind of minor narrative little tweaky scenario things, that's going to take you about three hours or so to run through. But I've found that you don't usually go through all of them. So you could go through a couple, get kind of beat up, and then exit out, and then maybe do another one and kind of see how that goes. But again, you can always kind of like save your game uh, to a certain degree uh, mid, mid progress, so that's not a big deal. So you can kind of make the playtime as long as you want, which is neat. So if you're like, well, we're getting through this thing, we've already been at this about you know an hour and a half or two hours, uh, Francesca's gotta go, um, so let's just wrap this one up, you know, it'll take us another 20 minutes and then we can save it and then she can go and we can play again later. So you can really kind of gauge that how you, as you want, and you almost have to talk about the playtime in this game as like what's the overall playtime. It's a more like a video game, which is kind of neat because like a lot of times when you hear people talk about a video game, they're like, well, it took me 20 hours to complete that game if you're talking about a solo game or that this game has 100 hours worth of content and so on. And I think this one, I've not really counted or whatever, but you're looking at like the 40 to 60 hour uh, amount of content to, to go through and complete the whole game if you were to succeed and not have to you know replay it again so that's also kind of an interesting aspect in a way of looking at the game and 
I don't know. I feel like it's a little bit, personally, I think it's a little bit overlooked in terms of some of the just small, subtle design things that they did here, just to kind of look at a board game differently. Yeah, it's legacy, but you're not tearing anything up. It's got these hands, handy uh, envelopes. It's You can kind of start and stop a campaign as you want, kind of like a quick save action. And you know, and then it's, it's a very big campaign that you can win or lose. And it's just got a lot of cool things. And all the mechanics and things are very, very interesting. Uh, I can talk, uh, go watch my review to get into some more of the crunchy mechanical details, but Definitely, uh, I love Blackstone Fortress, and I can't wait for more expansions and things and stuff to add to uh, the world. Now, in terms of you know other games, I've kind of mentioned here the other Warhammer Quests. If you like more of a fantasy thing, uh, these don't have as developed of a campaign, and uh, at least Silver Tower is not in print anymore, which kind of stinks. But I, you know, I'll tell you what, I it feels to me. Like they're gonna re, uh, re return <laughs> to Warhammer Quest in the Age of Sigmar universe, and I really hope that they kind of take this same approach that they did with Blackstone Fortress and all the stuff I just talked about, and then apply it to that fantasy that fantasy world. So, uh, yeah. But anyway, then I would just, I could just list off a bunch of other dungeon crawls too. But that's anyway Warhammer Quest Blackstone Fortress number ten, uh, number nine, completely different game style of game. This is uh, Cuba Libre here. Now this is a, a game from GMT Games. It's a coin game and I've reviewed quite a few of these in the past. This takes place uh, during the Cuban Revolution of the late 50s uh, with uh, Fidel Castro and uh, a bunch of other folks like that and the Mafia and all kinds of cool stuff. <laughs> so what a coin game is, it's a one to four player game and you, in this case, are playing sort of uh, insurgents and counterinsurgents, or you could use layman terms like terrorists and the state. If, so if you were uh, you know, part of the Cuban establishment back then, you would look at the communists coming up at you as terrorists. And uh, you know, there's other games in this series like Andy and Abyss, which has uh, what they call narco-terrorism. So you've got a lot of uh, uh, Pablo Escobar and his friends, and you've got the communist uh, FARC and the AUC, which are a bunch of like right-wing militia guerrilla folks, and then you've got the government in that game. Or you've also got games set in modern-day Afghanistan, or even back as far as the, uh, the, the, the American Revolution, where you've got the, the rebel, so to speak, and then the British and all that kind of stuff. So all of these coin games are always set in sort of a, a state, a primary power, with some insurgent powers that are either you know terrorists or they're trying to rebel or revolt or cause a revolution. So it's that, always through that kind of prism of sort of the, the big guy versus the little guy kind of thing. And there's usually at least four factions involved. Although there's one, I don't remember what it was. I haven't played it where there's only two factions, I believe. I haven't played it. So you can play this as a solo game as one of these factions against the other three factions. And it's got those like this, it looks a little bit more intimidating than it is, but it's still pretty intimidating. They have like these flow charts and things. So if you were playing as the Cuban government here, then you would sort of take the actions for these other factions and do that. But then you can also play a four player game when each player plays a different faction, or in this particular case, my favorite way to play this game, you can play it as a two player game, where in this case, you will play the Cuban government and the American uh, mafia, and you will play those two sides against both of the sort of competing sort of uh, communist uh, insurrection forces. So each, each player is controlling two factions. And you can do that with, I think, most of the coin games. So the thing is here, there's a little bit of coexistence involved, even though, let's say you're playing a four player game, there's only gonna be one winner, but the game naturally will have two allies, usually. So like in the case of Andy and Abyss, uh, it's the, hold on, I'm having a brain fart. Uh, the, it's the government and the AUC that sort of get into bed together. And then it's also the narcos and the cartels getting in bed, so to speak, with the, the communist uh, terrorists. And um, so, yeah, so you have these kind of natural allies, but in a four play game, you're still trying to win your own way. So each of these games, each of the factions has a completely different kind of winning condition. And a lot of people will say the new game Root that came out last year is sort of loosely based on a coin. And I guess it is, I think the designer said it was, I'm not super sure about that, but 
these games play nothing like coin and they go on much longer and there's arguably a lot more going on in these depending on the coin game that you're playing um and so each of the factions has a different win condition so when you play with two players you need to get both of your factions to their win condition before the your opponent does um, so it makes it a little bit more interesting and you can kind of see sort of the um uh, the complementariness of each of the factions and how they should behave together. Whereas you, if you put four players at the table, that doesn't always come out where it's like, well, okay, you guys should really be working together at the start of the game. And then they're like, well, screw you, I'm not working with you. And so, you know, it, it gets the, you get that human element into it a little bit more with the four player game. Uh, like that and so there's I can go over kind of the mechanics There's like some cards that flip over there's some event cards You can take actions on them or events similar to Twilight Struggle, but it's more of like a global uh, Stack of cards. There's no hand of cards So you're taking actions and things and flipping over new cards and scoring cards are coming up uh, somewhat randomly and then you're sort of reevaluating all the different scoring conditions and the end game conditions for the different factions uh, it, It's a good time at all of the different player counts um, specifically this game I like more than the other coin games because it's a little bit not as complex the map itself is not as complex as the smaller map and I feel like I was talking about with the two-player game how two factions are sort of a little bit more married together uh, it's a little bit more for me uh, uh, either enforced or just driven or mandatory that the two factions get together and I like that dynamic of in this case the government and the mafia getting together versus the two communists uh, or the two insurgents and I like that so it's just right away you having to work together uh, and that makes the, to me what makes this game a little bit more special uh, than well not just other coin games but a lot of other games and so I really 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 like that dynamic uh, in general, I like a lot of the coin themes, the more modern themes, because you don't really see good treatment of necessarily conflict a lot of times. A lot of times, for me, it's always like what happened after everything broke down and now we have troops and war and guns and tanks and bombs. And it's like, well, okay, that's now we're fighting and we're going to fight until one side gets sick of it or get, gets beat their face in. or. Um, you know, why don't we look at a little bit like, well, what the heck? Why did we get to this stupid point? And, um, and so this, these coin games sort of take that on. And so there is some like combat and dice and stuff like that, but you're not really too focused on the troop stuff too much. It's a little bit of that, but you're also focused on a lot of the events and things that sort of permeate the conflict. And so I can get into it a little bit more, uh, that way and just, you know, something to know about me i like playing uh games where there's a mafia involved <laughs> for some stupid reason um but yeah so there's the mafia in this one and so i like to me i like that little bit of the business element in in terms of just the game not like in real life so in the business element in these conflicts is always interesting because to me it cuts to the reality of it a little bit more where it's like you have this government force and this government force and maybe this one is backed by a religion or some other like uh, economic ethos or governmental like philosophy and other f nonsense and to me that's always like this is a personal thing so I mean it's like you're full of crap you're full of crap and you're full of crap because at the end of the day you want to make money you want to make money you want to make money you want to be in sa you want to have safety you want everybody to think like you and you want to be able to control everybody that's what all these things are doing and the business side of it is like they're just being very honest and they're like i want to make money and not die and and so i'm going to pull the strings as much as i can and so when you inject like the cartels and anti abyss or the mafia in this case it's like that's cool because i i can kind of get behind that a little bit as opposed to people sort of uh pretending or signaling that they're in it for uh you know the greater good and all that stuff and you know there's there's my cynicism coming through but yeah so that's why i like cuba libre a lot uh player count like i said all player counts good i like two player probably the best in this particular game and also the game the play time what does it say about play time does it say anything about these on gmt it usually doesn't uh i don't see anything oh half hour per Oh no, that's just the scale of it. So this, okay, this will take, depending on how you play it. So I've played a bunch of games of this and, and in a, a lot of the coin games, frankly, on Vassal, which is a online Java based program. And you can kind of like play by email. So I've 
honestly had like six games of coin games going on at once sometimes and uh, like you know three games of Cuba Libre going on so it's kind of hard to keep them straight sometimes but um, that you can get through a game if you're playing in that scope in about a month ish kind of depending on how fast people take their turns but if you're sitting down to play a coin game which i've done a couple of times you're looking at the four hour range and that really depends on the coin game but for this one you should be able to get it done in about four hours and if you solo it um you should be about the four or five hour range the nice thing is you can, you can kind of keep it set up which i've done i'll set one of these up play a couple hours one night and then come back the night after maybe doing a couple hours and then maybe a third night if I just kind of taking my time kind of sipping my tea kind of thing uh, And then as far as like other games, you know, I kind of mentioned all the other coin games and in abyss probably my other favorite The and these were the first two and in abyss and Cuba Libre. I kind of mentioned my mafia thing um, but I also like Liberty of Death and um, A distant plane was good uh, fire in the lake was good. That one was about Vietnam uh, yeah, so I like them in general. I haven't played any of the most recent ones because frankly like like I'm honestly I've played 50 games of coin like if you include all the vassal games and stuff I played so my brain's a little bit like you know with new coin games <laughs> But anyway, that's Cuba Libre. That's number nine number eight Sort of going back to the original theme we started with is uh, Shadows of Brimstone. So this is another dungeon crawly co-op type of thing and I'm just showing you this one box I think you might be able to see on top of my shelf it's kind of like shadows of brimstone is taking it over uh because i got so much stuff for it uh so this is in a different way than blackstone fortress which i just talked about uh this is a little bit more of your basic dungeon crawl in terms of your everyday mechanics now the theme is well either cowboys or old japanese samurais that have sort of found these caves and portals into other dimensions and space and time and all that stuff and found this thing called Darkstone. And the Darkstone is like this magical rock that does all this crazy stuff and makes you shoot, shoot fire bullets with your shotgun or whatever, imbues you with some magical powers. Um, the character I like to play is a nun wielding shotgun that has magical powers, which is rad. <laughs> anyway, so uh, that's the theme of it and so your basic mechanics is like move around shoot stuff and roll dice so not super innovative there like you get loot and grab cards out of the loot deck and all that kind of stuff and so if you, just on the surface if you were just like well that was it you'd be like hmm all right that's just kind of basic it's fun don't get me wrong i like playing the game obviously it's my number eight um and it's it's all good and fine but then where this sort of takes off and starts to go up the uh roller coaster is the campaign side of it uh, and so typically what you do with this game is it's almost like playing a roguelike if you're familiar with that type of video game where you can just say let's do this today and we're going to go into the mine in the old west and just go see what we stumble into or we're going to go through this little mini sort of campaign and go through this spe uh, specific uh, other world. We might go into an alien spaceship. We might go into a lava world or something. So you you can kind of just choose what you want to do. You may go have like a gunfight in town in the old west or something, or go explore uh, you know, Japan and they're coming out with like new ones in the Vikings and the conquistadors and just other random, you know, periods of history. So it just like, and it just like abuses the history. Like there's no, don't even trip on that. Like it just goes, you know, just nonsense cartoon uh, stuff, which is fine. And uh, so you just kind of pick and choose what you want to do. And you just kind of level up your character. Now your character is going to go through a lot of crazy things. Uh, some of the fun parts of it there are the in-between uh, game session things. Uh, so unlike Blackstone Fortress, you just have like, you go through a dungeon crawl map and you know, fight stuff. Uh, and then in between, you like take a, a coach back to town and go visit different things in town and like spooky things in town will crop up. But your character can start to mutate. Um, it's been several months since we played this with my group, uh, but some funny things that, <laughs> that have happened, uh, you know, well, one character has a tail and I believe it has like an eye on the end of the tail. And so it kind of just like hits stuff. <laughs> like it could hit, it's, you could hit him, like the own character. It could hit us. Uh, I think he's got horns or something. So like when he goes into a shop to buy things, the shopkeepers are like, it's gonna be $10 extra for you there, pal. 
because he looks so hideous. Um, and all kinds of just, you know, funky stuff. So the mutation thing is really cool. Um, sometimes it'll help you, sometimes it'll hurt you. And if you think of like a campaign game like a Necromunda or something where, you know, you like get an injury and you lose an eye or you get a limp and stuff like that. This is just all like wacky, crazy, dark stone infused you know, Cthulhu-esque almost, uh, just crap, just happening in the game. And so just the whole, the whole like just concept, I've talked about this in a couple of other games like Eldritch Horror and uh, Defenders of the Realm in previous videos, but it's like, if I wanna just like crack the box open and then be like, well, I'm going on an adventure, not to sound like Bilbo, but you know, it's like just what's happening today. This game like has that in spades. It, there's no, it, there's like no rules really to like what you can do as far as the campaign. You basically play this until you hit level eight and then you're kind of just a giant badass and then you stop. And so the game will scale and things based on number of players and the highest level and all that kind of stuff. So the characters and things or the monsters and things are gonna get progressively harder and just kind of just beefed up and, and get kind of nutty, frankly, uh, once you get up to like level six or so. Yeah, and they get kind of crazy about then. And then, you know, then you kind of slog your way through and you just kind of play and it's like, well, what happened? Well, like nothing, it's life. You know, there's no end. You just, you retire that character and you guys start over. Like there's there's no payoff. And like, you know, I kind of mind that. It's like, okay, well that we had our adventure. We can go retire to the tavern or the inn and, and tell our tales and nobody will believe us, you know, at the old saloon and all that. So that's all this really is. Uh, well, I should say there are some scenarios and stuff that are geared up that are more boss level scenarios too But you just kind of like say well, we feel like we're pretty high level. Let's play this scenario and there's not like a real Concrete linear narrative or anything like that uh, But I love that. I mean, that's just great. It's just it's almost uh, you know, there's a little bit of I Don't know. I mean, I don't want to oversell them Just put printing out stuff to play in because that's yeah, I don't know. There's kind of you know, there's a little courage to that, I think. You know, it's just like, yeah, whatever, you just go play, with, do what you want. There it is, go jump in. I don't know, play what you want. And it's just, it, it like teeters on that line between miniature game, board game, role-playing game and stuff. So it's just a fun place to go jump into. Oh, um, player count, I think it plays the six. This, a four. Oh, uh, no, this box says four in it. But I th you can play it up six players. There's some modifications for that. Um, and then one to six players. I've played it solo. My favorite is to play it with my, some of my friends uh, in the next town over. And uh, and that's because you can't just be like, oh, oh, look, my guy got a tail. And then you look around, and there's like nobody to tell. You know, <laughs> that's not that fun. And so, but if you have to sit around with some friends and it's just, you know, you can all laugh at Billy because, you know, Billy's having a bad day, you know, that's more fun. Um, in terms of playtime, a scenario is going to take, I think it usually take more than an hour or so. It kind of depends. Some scenarios are longer than others. But then after the scenario, you're going to want to do the trip to town and the town, and that sometimes can take an hour. Um, so usually, we when we play, we usually play a couple of scenarios and stuff, and then, you know, pack it up and, and everything. The thing is, is weird about this game, and I kind of wish, although at this point, you can kind of just do what you want as a player. But they have like character sheets, like an RPG that you can print out and stuff. And that's really where we live. And, they, and the game has like so many just decks of cards everywhere. It's completely unwieldy and, and ridiculous. It would be, I think it would be kind of nice if they didn't do that, where they had things that were more bookified. But I don't really know. The cards, even though there's a lot of cards and just junk all over the table, it is useful. It's not super fiddly to play. It is fiddly a little bit to set up. It takes up a lot of room is really the main problem. In terms of mechanics and stuff and like, you know, transitioning through a game, it's easy. It's easy. And the rules, the rule book's fine and you can get right through it and, and the, the ease of play is all there, but it just takes up so much room. And so I think if people like look at it and they look like, oh, that looks like a nightmare, but it's not. It's a piece of cake. Um, it would be nice in some ways, maybe, if they condense everything down in the book. That's one thing I kind of feel like I'm playing a role-playing game, and then I'm feeling like sort of cheated out of that because there's all these decks of cards, because that's, you know, driving encounters and loot and treasure and map tile placement and stuff. But it all works. It just takes up a lot of room. Uh, so, anyway, so that's Shadows of Brimstone, I think. Oh, the other game that I would mention alongside this, and it's more that... If you play this other game, I think you would like this too, but for different reasons, and that'd be Kingdom Death Monster. 
Uh, now that is a little bit more linear of a narrative, whereas this is a little bit more freeform. And that's why I kind of like this more because you can just kind of jump in and all the stuff I just talked about a couple minutes ago and do whatever you want. And Kingdom of Death is, has a feel like that and it's a different thing where you're sort of building up your, uh, sort of rebuilding civilization in this existential waste of a nation place. Um, and, <laughs> You know, so it's a different thing. So it has like that same sort of large vibe, massive, like weird funk to it in Kingdom Death. And Kingdom Death is much darker and probably X-rated and stuff. Um, and so this is kind of in that ballpark of like jumping into just insanity. But this one's way more fun and friendly. <laughs> and just, it's like the, 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 the comedy version of Kingdom Death, which is like the, the saw version of whatever. So anyway, that is number eight. Oh, no, number seven is going to be completely different from what we've seen so far. It's fun, fun. This is Clash of Cultures. Uh, this is a civilization game from Z-Man Games, which they no longer have the rights to publish. The designer is shopping it around. He is in like a really heavy playtest mode right now, uh, which excites me. And uh, so this will be coming out soon. Well, maybe, I mean, who knows what could actually happen, but I got a feeling it's gonna be coming out soon-ish, maybe in two years, but you know, it could be a year, it could be whatever. So they're coming out, they're gonna increase the player count. Now this plays two to four players. Uh, I've also got the expansion for this. And, and to my, for my mind, the game is fine without the expansion, but once you add the expansion, then it's, you know, what, what did I say, number seven? This is number seven on my list, so there you go. I think without the expansion, it's not this high. Uh, so it's a civilization game, it's like what you'd think. You think it's a civilization, civilization uh, computer game and there's uh, the other board games that have come out, uh, you know, Mega Civ and Sid Meier's Civilization and some other games that I can't think of. This is by far my favorite civilization game. Absolutely love this game. Uh, it's got all the tra trappings of that. You're leveling up your technology, you're kind of growing from just a little you know, minor settlement up into, uh, you know, a larger nation that has some dominance over a portion of a planet, that kind of stuff. Uh, the expansion in this case adds some sort of uh, real historical civilizations and leaders and things that you can uh, sort of dive into. So you can kind of pretend, oh, we're Julius Caesar and we're Rome or uh, we're from Japan or there's uh, uh, all kinds of different, there's a, uh, sorry, Aztec, uh, you know, leaders and stuff like that. It's from, so from all different walks of history are there and there's some different leader cards. And those are gonna kind of basically just give you um, asymmetric abilities and starting points uh, for your civilization. And I think that really adds to the game and here's why. So when you play just the base game, Everybody's got the same, you're on the same, you know, even ground. You kind of grow your civilization a little bit, build some troops for defense, fight some barbarians, uh, you know, build shipping routes and stuff, interact a little bit with players. There's trading involved. You can trade these objective cards and special cards and things like that, resources and things like that. Uh, so you kind of grow up and you have maybe, maybe a big battle in the middle at the end of the game or something. Or, you know, maybe in the battles kind of like escalate over the game. But when you splash in the... Uh, so, you know, special kind of historical civilization thing. Then you have like some built-in objectives and some special abilities and some tendencies that you want to follow to sort of, you know, play your civilization the best you can. And so with the expansion, I've seen games end in a variety of different ways, which is really cool because one of the cool things about the civilization uh, computer game is like the different kinds of victories that you can have. So you can just, your, your nation can become so rich or so technical, uh, technologically advanced or so militarily advanced and so on. And then, you know, that's just the way civilizations can go. So when you have just a base game, you don't really get that with this, but once you have introduced the expansion, I've seen games end where there's like been hardly any combat in the game. And everybody's been like, huh, that's weird. There was just like that one skirmish between Joel and Billy in the third round and everything else is, I mean, there's been the threat of it. And then I've seen other games of it though, where it's like 
freaking bloodbath like from like round two on it's just nasty uh and it's kind of based on just you know player mood a little bit and sort of the dynamics of how the game sort of unfolds over the course of the turns and then also though you've got these different uh things that you're doing you're like well i'm not just gonna go fight him you know i could maybe beat him i'm gonna lose some of my forces but oh well if i do this you know i'm gonna get a little bit of bonus on my trade route or something you know so you can see it's just a little bit more organic uh, the way that the game unfolds. It's not going to play out the same every time. And so I absolutely love that. And so the thing that this has going for it is the way it kind of treats all those kind of various aspects of civilization is really cool. Like the combat's really straightforward. It's some simple dice combat, roll some D6s, divide by five. Uh, you've got some good mitigation and all the different tech boards and everything that you can do. Uh, you can set up trade routes and supply routes and sort of leech a little bit off of other players, which is nice. A lot of times in a civilization game, it kind of bugs me. Through the Ages does this a little bit. I like Through the Ages enough, but the one player will take like the coal mine and I'll be like, I don't know how to mine coal now for five turns because you took it like okay day. <laughs> so you know that's I'm like didn't I just go send a spy in and steal your tech or learn from you somehow like I thought it was a civilization game anyway that's always kind of irked me about civilization games but this one you can kind of set up routes and sort of milk off uh, resources and convert them into gold and stuff like that and there's some other kind of weird things you can do with some of the different technologies and the government technologies that you can do that kind of give you like sort of an end game engine to go after lots of cool little mechanical stuff like that and it's got trading and so this is all start talking about player count now is absolutely for me okay like it's fine ish two player it's a little better three player although with three player you kind of have that Billy and Joel fighting, so Francesca just walks away with it, kind of thing. Or Billy and Francesca team up on Joel, you know, he, you know, fighting. So three-player dynamic, a little funky, but that's kind of a natural thing that a lot of these sort of dudes in the map games have. So at four players, though, the game shines, and I'm glad that the expansion or the new printing that's coming out. I don't know if he's actually going to have it be a five and six-player game. But if it does, the game will take forever, but I will play it at least once a year if he does that. Uh, because at the four player game, you've got, right, you've got player to your left and right. Everybody has a player to their left and right they gotta watch. So you can't just go fight left because you're gonna get hit on right. Because if you send all your troops over here, they're gonna walk in and just squish all your little settlements. So there's the balance there. You've also got the balance of trading because like I said, you can trade resources and cards and things. So the way that the game scores victory points is well there's a few different ways but one of the ways is these objective cards that you can play and they give you kind of little cool civilization little uh tricks that you can do and so if i have one that's like i'm not going to do this i can show this hey billy take a look at that can you do that because he's sitting across the table and those cards are going to have sort of a more civic type of victory point and then a more combat type of victory point and they're dual purpose cards which again i like multi-purpose cards too so i can give that to him and i'm like you're really doing well on that gold there you don't need an extra piece of gold i'm gonna give you this you're far away over there you're not to my left or right uh, I, i'll trade you this for a gold because i need a gold because that's allowed me to build my port and i just need that one extra resource so it adds that trading dynamic which then it just el escalates this game just you know it hums it just rises on the tide it surfs that wave right in and then it's the best civilization game i've ever played <laughs> and yeah so just at that four player count is what i'm talking about right here it's fine at two and three player it's a fun exercise it's good fun mechanics all that kind of stuff but if we're talking like why does joel love the game is because of the four player game and trading is involved and uh and so let's talk about play time now we talked about player count my favorite's four four players you're going to be pushing the three to four hour range it may take longer if everybody doesn't know how to play uh, but having played this with my group a few times uh, when we get uh, enough players that have played it multiple times, you know, we don't always get four players that have played it a lot. But, you know, we'll maybe have a new player or whatever. But we can do three, four hours. Yeah, four hours or so. We usually, you know, break it up with like a meal or something in between. So maybe take five with that. But it's like, let's set aside this evening or this Saturday and do that. So you're looking at the three, if you kind of slow roll it, you know, up to five hours if you're just chilling. Um, and like I said, the four player, two player though, you can probably play in a couple hours. I played two player a couple times and it's not too bad, a couple hours. Uh, Billy can correct me if I'm wrong on that. I played with him a couple times, two players. Um, yeah, so there's that. And then 
as far as other games go, to me, this, if I just throw out the expansion, it kind of feels more like Eclipse than anything. And that's because it's this kind of 4X idea where you kind of explore new space and reveal new tiles. And then there's a lot of fighting and there's usually a big fight at the end to determine the winner. So that's how Eclipse kind of uh, shakes itself out. I really like Eclipse. But like I said, with this, with the expansion of four players, just I don't, I don't want to play anything else. That's in the same sort of dudes on a map uh, ballpark until I talk about another game here in a couple minutes. <laughs> and, but you know, as far as that Civilization 4X thing, that pure kind of 4X, this is the tops for me. And if you like Eclipse, then I would take a look at this. But fortunately, it's not in print right now. Uh, when it does come out, though, hopefully it does play five to six players because I would totally eat up a Saturday uh, to play a nice, epic six-player. Oh, I get so excited. <laughs> six-player Clash of Cultures. Just, you know, Rome versus Japan versus Aztec versus Russia versus whatever. Yeah, that'd be sweet. All right, so that is number seven, Clash of Cultures. Switching gears completely again. We're going to go to number six here, and that's uh, San Juan. Now this is the second edition of the game, which is to me a absolute must. And this is to, this, this game is super special to me. Uh, I played this game for a long time and I had some old friends of mine teach me this game several years ago. Gosh, it must have been 15 years ago. I'm not sure when this game was published, but I think they got it right after it came out. And because it was probably about 2004 or five, uh, when I was taught this game and I remember playing this game and, and I used to like magic, you know, Magic the Gathering and they're like, let's play this game San Juan. And they're like, I'm like, what's that? And like, Look at it. It looks boring. <laughs> and then, um, you know, like, well, it's like Puerto Rico, but the card game, I don't like Puerto Rico. All right. Just don't tell anybody. And I was like, Oh, really? Okay. And so I was like, okay, fine. It was just the three of us. We usually had more at a game night. And so it was uh, me and my friend and his wife, who's also my friend. And uh, and um, uh, so like we played it. And like halfway through the game, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I love this. What is this? I've never played a game like this. I said, this is like playing magic, but you're like getting the cards as you go. And like, it's cool. And the deck's in the middle and everybody's sharing the deck. And now I have cards and I can, oh, I, to play this card, I gotta pay for it with another card. I gotta discard cards to play for it. Oh, and then I have all these buildings and they work together doing combos. It's like magic. I, you know, I have the librarian and this and that. And then we're choosing roles and it's triggering. And it's like, oh my gosh, this, I love this. <laughs> and I was able to get into it, you know, and play it like right away, halfway through the first game. And we must have played it like two or three times that night. I think we played it three times. And then I was like, I absolutely in, in love with this game. It's just, it's got the multi-use cards. It's got different combos, lots of different strategies that you can employ. Now, in terms of the strategy side, this is why you want second edition. Second edition comes with uh, the, the expansion that came out some time ago. And so it's a bunch of new cards that you add to it. That kind of rounds out the viability of a lot of the strategies. Because, uh, uh, you know, you don't really need to play. If you just had like the first edition, you found it for a few bucks. Like I'd still get it. You'll still get some plays out of it for sure. Like you're not immediately, in my opinion, I mean, unless you like want to point Dexter and ruin the game for yourself, you're not going to immediately like just discover all the, like the best strategies and stuff with like a couple of number six buildings and then you know the librarian. But um, it's so you still get some good plays out of it if you find it for a few bucks. But having the second edition and expansion stuff that gives you a lot more viability, a lot more feasibility to really truthfully have competitive strategies going against each other. Um, and so again, this is like, you know, Race for the Galaxy was kind of built on this or they're kind of developed at the same time, you know, and you know, so you can kind of see Race for the Galaxy, Roll for the Galaxy, Puerto Rico's in the mix. Um, the, the New Frontiers, which I talked about a couple of videos ago, but this is great because I can play this nowadays. I play this with the family all the time. And I played it at game night and stuff like that, obviously. Um, and so that is, to me, it's like, especially with second edition and then some of the expansions, I get the same amount of strategy and stuff out of this that I do out of like Race for the Galaxy, which I do enjoy. But that there's such like that huge like tidal wave of a surf you got to ride up to get over the crest and get down into the actual playing a game of it. Uh, to me, I once once you get the extra stuff for this, then it's 
the same ba ballpark experience and it's so quick and, and just like vicious almost to play and you know it gets super tense and it becomes a more knowable quantity and then like a huge stack of race for the galaxy cards when you're like doing all this stuff i didn't even i don't even know what you're doing like i don't even care because you're just doing all this stuff and i'm like oh no, no i've never seen cards like that you know, this is like, it's in, it's in a, a perfectly confined space that's knowable and I can bounce off the walls of that sphere of the game space here. Oh yeah, so this game's friggin' awesome. Like I, I recommend this like a thousand percent to anybody that likes the game. If you like magic and you're like, well these dorks playing board games. I'm like, well nobody plays magic. I mean everybody plays magic, but you're like, what are all these idiots playing? Like, here you go, this pick up San Juan and play it like a thousand times. It's amazing. Okay, that was number six, and number five here, switching a little bit of gears now, is Forbidden Stars, Warhammer 40,000 Forbidden Stars. Also, never going to be reprinted, probably, which, all right, sucks. <laughs> so this is a four-player game, or two to four-player game, uh, it takes place in the 40k universe. It's kind of like... Eclipse or Clash of the Cultures or Dudes on the Map game. It's got some real different stuff going on though. Uh, so you have a tiles set out with kind of 40k space. You've got the different factions, the orcs, the Chaos Marines, the Ultramarines, and the Eldar, the cheaters. <laughs> and then uh, so you're you're not trying to like just take over territory and do that kind of stuff, although that's part of the game. You've got ground troops and spaceships and all that stuff that you're flying around. And you're trying to basically go and like control uh, different objectives. And they give you these little tokens that you put out. It might be like rescuing a key character or assassinating this other character and stuff. So you kind of draft that whole setup. You build the tile space and all the spaces on the board and the planets. And then you have your little objective tokens. Like I'm putting them out for other players. So I'm trying to put them in like the worst spot possible. And then you know other players are doing that for you and then you're trying to take control of territory and get resources and build up bastions and uh you know grow your troops and all that kind of stuff and and uh you know all that kind of thing and then you're just trying to get to a point where you can control certain areas so you're kind of just sort of like working together and trying to tamp things down there's this like giant warp thing that's flying around that i hated the first time i played it but i love it because you just you have to deal with this warp that one of the players can move around and just totally like well i can't move through that now and so there's all this kind of crazy stuff. The combat's really cool. It's like deck building combat. So as you do upgrades, you always have a, a deck of 10 cards. And so you replace cards, you pull out like, I think there's three copies of each card and then you pull them out and you replace them with three copies of some other card. And it's got this sort of uh, card playing augmented dice combat thing. It's super simple and, uh, and really cool. It's, it's a lot more than just like rolling dice and doing hits. It's, you know, playing cards at certain points, changing the dice and all that kind of stuff, digging through your deck and things like that. Uh, there's just a lot of cool elements and things like that. There's the order placement and just mechanically for me, this is just one of the most interesting games because it's really a very simple game. And it's also at the same time, though, a very strategically and tactically, like just there's just a lot to sort of, you know, you can kind of bluff around and chew on and try to go for. Um, uh, yeah, because you like you just put your order tokens out, everybody flips them over in a certain order, you, you resolve the orders, and you kind of try to like figure out the right order to resolve your orders and all this stuff. And it's just dead, dead simple. And it's just. It's a, free, it's a breath of fresh air because you're not just like taking over territory to control territory. Like there's not really turtling involved. And some of these other games, well, ones that aren't good, you know, sometimes you sit and turtle and you just kind of grow. And I can think of another space game, you know, where you just kind of like turtle and, you know, you nothing really sucking you out unless you have players kind of dorking you around and stuff. So this like, it's almost like an answer to a lot of fixes for this style of game while still retaining all of that heavy metal like nonsense Ameritrash stuff that I really like uh, without getting too like stuffy, you know, like sometimes some of these uh, dudes on the map games can get. Uh, and so this game is just, man, it's just, it's just fun. Like it's one of these games now, I'm getting into the top five. 
And I'm like, I don't know, it's fun. Like, leave me alone. <laughs> like, that's what I almost want to say for all of these games. I'm like, whatever, it's just super fun. Get out of my face. Like, when we say something smart about this genius design that I had no part in figuring out why they made the decisions they did, like, I'm not going to money more to quarterback this. It's amazing. <laughs> that's how I feel. <laughs> like, at this point, I'm talking about the game. So, like, trying to be smart. And then it's like, I don't know, whatever. Just leave me alone. <laughs> this is going to be three hours of amazing fun. So, that's what this is. That's all of this is. And I don't know, it's really fun. So, the other games that I don't want to like to dogpile too much on, I would say I kind of already mentioned uh, Kemet and stuff and Inish and that kind of thing. So, anything that has taken like kind of like old school dudes on the map and been like, you know what, let's take some of these weird Euro mechanics and funky ways of, you know, doing turn order and actions and like, let's, you know, apply it to just a fun smash you in the face game. Uh, so like Inish and, uh, you know, Kemet and all that kind of stuff. And I talked about um, Lords of Hellas and stuff earlier and the, the all cool stuff. Just, just taking a, a real good look at that whole kind of fun, just, you know, little war game type of thing and just you know doing something new and fresh with it and this here is one of those and uh yeah and just really to me all, it's because all the mechanics are really good and the theme and the graphics of everything are really nice um but it's that whole mechanic of you have to control these objectives and it's just so objective based and so it just makes you think and plan so differently than you normally do in this type of style of game all right so that's for Ben stars oh i didn't talk about player count stuff Hmm. I, I've played it at all the player counts. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. three and four. I, I like it two player though. It's fun. It's fine. It's just more fun with the three and four player. It doesn't really have that problem like I talked about with Clash of Cultures, with the you know the three player dynamic too much, just because objectives are going to be sort of theoretically evenly spread. So it's not too bad. Uh, Four players, I think kind of just decreasingly slightly gets worse the less players you go. But not like in a way that it's like, well, it's bad at two. It's just like four players just, you know, is just amazingness. And then, you know, three players like really good. And two players like, wow, this is actually really good. Two player, you know. Um, yeah, and then play time, three, four hours. Kind of depends on the number of players and people have played before. But it's, you know, it's a longer game for sure. So anyway, that's number what was that five? Okay, that was number five. Number four is a stack of books, and this is Frostgrave. This is all the stuff I have for Frostgrave. I love Frostgrave. See, I'm at the point. I'm like, I don't want to explain to you why I like Frostgrave. <laughs> Frostgrave is awesome. It's you know, if you've not heard of it, it's usually a two-player game although i've played it up to four players um each player gets a wizard and they get some miniatures other miniatures that are like the little war band they have a, well they have a wizard and an apprentice they have a bunch of spells there's like 80 spells or something in the game so you pick a school of magic and and print out some cards or some cheat sheets and spells and you play a little miniature game on a four by four table or three by three i should say yeah and um you know, you just kind of do, you go to war and do battle and you try to get treasure tokens or do whatever the scenario objective is. Uh, you want a whole bunch of terrain just to like block line of sight because there's a bunch of range combat and spells and stuff, obviously. Um, yeah, it's awesome. It's rad. It's it's a campaign game. I mean, it doesn't have to be, but that's what you want to do. You want to build your war band and grow it up like a Necromunda or a Mordheim kind of thing. Um, it's very magic heavy. I mentioned Mordheim. More times, more like a you know old school fantasy, lots of melee combat, a little bit of range and things, a little bit of spell casting maybe. I never never explained more time, but uh, this is like magic crazy. Like you can have walls of smoke and walls and teleport things and telekinetically you know telekinesis things and uh, mind control stuff and all that kind of stuff. You could have uh, random monster encounters, which is like that for some reason is like what really sold me on the game. I was playing, I'm like, eh, yeah, let's push them on, guys around, shoot, boo boo, roll some dice. And then it's like, oh shit, or oh, excuse me, and then, you know, like a demon showed up, you know, and it's like, oh, it's chasing this guy, that's funny, you know, and you just, it's just, it's a, it's a world that is alive. It's just super alive. And like I said, the magic is alive. And that's what's cool. It's, it's, it's just magic nonsense. The other thing, mechanically, that makes it alive is a D20. 
Now, this is gonna be a deal breaker for some people, but everything is a D20. So if you think about it, a D20 is like all over the place. And I can think of one specific time at Gen Con, I embarrassed myself in front of the designer of the game. Well, I didn't embarrass myself. My wizard embarrassed himself. It was pathetic. So he took a little bit of damage from a demon and then uh, proceeded to heal himself. Critically failed the heal spell, doing more damage to himself. And then he did it two more times and he died trying to heal himself. So I was left only with my apprentice and a bunch of other warband idiots. <laughs> so you might say, well, that sucks. That's fair. <laughs> It did suck, but it was also really funny and awesome. <laughs> so knowing that you can have crazy just stuff happen, then you got to kind of be okay with it. So again, the magic's alive, the world's alive, there's monsters coming out everywhere after you, things are going to go really wrong or really right, and there's spells flying all over the place. Uh, there's a ton of different content out here for this. Uh, I've done a lot of video reviews on a lot of things. And I just want to say go watch them <laughs> because I would say for anybody that's interested in this, you can get the base, just the main book, grab some Reaper Bones miniatures, some Descent miniatures or whatever fantasy game you got, like Zombie Side, if you've got like a Black Plague or Green Horde or something, uh, you can grab some miniatures out of that or whatever. And then you can look at some of these books. Here, let's just do this. And you can look at the Frostgrave Folio is one here. This has a lot of good extra rules and things like that that I like. And then you've also got Into the Breeding Pits, which has a lot of kind of like indoor rules. So I think with this one, what you do is you take like a tile set or print out some maps from like a drive through RPG or something. So there's like indoor cavern rules. We're not really like above ground, you know, jumping off towers and ruins and stuff. This is more like you're in a tunnel. So you can kind of, you know, the rules a little bit make a little more sense and make the terrain itself a little bit more dynamic. Um, and then, yeah, there's some other ones too, but those are kind of like the first ones that I would say uh, uh, to get into. And I guess, well, I'm looking at this, I guess I should sort of say this. Um, so I actually have a scenario of my own uh, that uh, the designer helped me with. And uh, we, he, we have some sort of, uh, I don't know what you call these, like third party scenarios or whatever. This is the Wizard Conclave. And so there's a bunch of folks that are like, uh, this is embarrassing. There's like black library authors and stuff in here. <laughs> like I have no business being in the same book as. And other folks in here, some other YouTube folks and all kinds of other stuff. And there's just a bunch of other crazy scenarios here. So I wrote, I wrote, I think a really fun and cool scenario uh, in this wizard Con conclave book here. So there's a lot of, basically this is a bunch of little one-offs, maybe one or two scenario mini campaign things that you can do as well. But this is, this is not something I would say run out and get um, uh, right away. Those other ones for sure. Uh, so yeah, so uh, um, yeah, it's just to me, like I said, it's, a, it's an alive world, blah, blah, blah. It's really fun and just wacky and fun. Uh, as far as player count, I played it with uh, two and four players. I've only, mostly I played it with two players. And mm, I don't know, I kind of like it with four players too. It's a two player game, I don't know. It's kind of fun when you get everybody on the table and just, just go nuts. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't matter to me too much, player count. I don't think I'd want to go more than four. I think I just that'd be kind of nutty, just too much. But, um, uh, two, three, four, you know, you might get in that problem. I'm not played it with three, but you might get in that problem with like, you know, two mages kind of getting fighting, but you got enough like characters and stuff lying around that it's not, I don't think that would be a huge problem in this game, to be honest. And if you have some monsters roaming around, it's like, that's a, that's a fourth player there, uh, you know, messing stuff up. In terms of playtime, a scenario is probably going to take you about an hour. You know, it could take you 30 minutes because if things could go horribly wrong for one player or things could just be going horribly right for all the players and then things are just dying left and right because your spells and stuff are going off. Uh, so yeah, so it's about half an hour to maybe it's slightly over an hour, if anything. Um, although in the campaign side of it, you know, that can go as for as long as you want. Um, there are some campaigns, sort of narrative linear type things in some of these books, although 
mm, I don't know, my personal preference is to kind of pick stuff out and play it, like I kind of talked about earlier with Shadows of Brimstone, just like, because you're kind of re-diving into the, the world of Frostgrave, which is a, which I didn't mention, is like a sort of a thawing city, and now magic is just going crazy. So, it's, my idea is just to go revisit it, and just see like, oh, this time there's a Lich Lord, you know, or this time we're in the catacombs, or this time blah blah blah, or we're just playing the random, random kind of roll-up uh, treasure token scenario, which is perfectly fine too. Um, so yeah, so there's just a lot of different stuff to play play with, and it's it's like an RPG. This is similar to Shadows of Brimstone. Uh, is more of a board game RPG. This is kind of a miniature RPG. You know, you level up your your wizard and your apprentice and get more spells and treasure and all that kind of stuff. So, yep, yeah, it's great. I love it. It's it's it's, it's I don't know. This is the game that got me into miniatures, really. I mean, some of these other games sort of did, but then when I played this, I was like, what? You can do this? <laughs> this is a thing that I can do? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's neat. Nobody told me. <laughs> that, you know, I'm, I'm, meanwhile, but yeah, it's like, oh, this is freaking fantastic. All right. So that's uh, that's number four, Frostgrave. Oh, um, I talked about player count and playtime. The other game that I would mention in the same breath as this is actually a board game and that's mage wars which is sort of been sort of dormant for a few years uh that's like a it's a it's a miniatures game frankly mage wars is a miniature game but instead of miniatures you have cards that you move around a grid board that's in like a uh an arena and uh and you cast spells and you have a spell book and like when you cast a spell you just flip through your actual book and then pay the mana cost and then play the card and then it's gone so think of it like playing, it was always sold to me by the, the actually the owner of the company and designer. He said, the first thing he said to me, he's like, it's like playing magic, but if magic was real. And I was like, what? And then, then he explained like, you actually have a spell book and all this stuff. So that, I love Mage Wars. But frankly, Frost Rave like just, just like rolled over it. Like it's just like, oh, oh, I've been playing Mage Wars now. For, whoa, forget about that, Frostgrave. Um, but Major is excellent, uh, and it's it's really visceral and tactical and wild magic and just crazy spells and stuff going on. Uh, but it's all contained on a board with cards and things. So if you like Mage Wars, take a look at Frostgrave. And if you're like Frostgrave looks cool, but I don't know about paint minis and doing a bunch of terrain, but the whole magic nonsense stuff sounds cool, then take a look at Mage Wars. You should be able to find Mage Wars pretty cheap actually, because they kind of like let that one just kind of fade away. So that was number four. And I know I thought hard about this. I know some people are gonna say, this is cheating, Joel. <sighs> you know what, this is my list. So number three is Rangers of Shadowdeep, which, if you're not familiar with it, uses really close to the same system as uh, Frostgrave. And but it is a cooperative and or solo adventure. So you don't play against each other. You play a either yourself or some other friends, up to four players. I don't, you're not gonna play with more than four. Well, you, you kind of could, but I'll let you explore that if you, if you get the game. Uh, and you're gonna play through a very strict, uh, somewhat linear narrative campaign. Uh, and this game, I was like, oh no. <laughs> All that that whole this fool of myself I made talking about Frostgrave. And I'm like, oh, I like this better. <laughs> this is so much, this is just so fun. I've only played this solo, which is, Billy, you, you're gonna say it's sad, Billy. It's not sad. It's fun, it's fine. <laughs> so this is a good solo game. I've not actually played this with players. Uh, I would, 100%. I've actually completed, uh, let's see, doo -doo -doo. completed the basic campaign in here and then this little mini campaign. There's actually like a higher level campaign in this and then also in this, which I haven't played yet. But as so I played my characters up to almost level six and uh, they go through this thing and it's like this darkness has taken over the land and I got my ranger and she's got her friends and you know it's got different heroes that are with her and we're going this thing we're fine it was like this mystery we're unraveling and there's like little narrative things and it's like a choose your own adventure it's almost like playing D, &D solo because you've got the dm here in the book telling you what's going on but the system it's actually i mean like i said i would play it again 
because it does this really smart thing. Uh, you know, the mechanics and stuff, whatever, it's fine. You move around and shoot stuff and roll d20s. It works great. It's beautiful. It's a great little simple system. The same as Frostgrave. You do skill checks and stuff. The thing that like zeroes this in for me is the event system. So you take a normal deck of cards, a 52 deck of cards, it'll take, so tell you to take out like, take out the ace through the 10 of hearts. Shuffle them up, every round you flip it over. Oh, it's two hearts, what's it say in the book? Okay, summon some giant flies. Okay, next turn, uh, and uh, eight of hearts. Oh, that's an earthquake. Everybody roll for their, uh, I don't know, climbing. And then the next one, oh, well, that's a bad, you know, because then now a troll is spawned and all that. And so what happens is you play these scenarios and I just ran, called out a bunch of random events. They're not random. They are coupled relatively tightly to the scenario you're doing. So the stuff that's happening is like stuff that you kind of expect would happen. It just may not come at the you know exact same order. Um, and it's it's a blast. It's just awesome. Do, people can die, you know, and level up and all that kind of stuff. And you don't have to worry about somebody getting too high a level because like, oh, I don't wanna play you anymore because you're level eight wizard and I'm level two, that sucks. <laughs> so play your level two wizard, Frankie. Um, so this is cool. And this is like, this This is one of those, you want a lot of good terrain or a good map or something. Uh, you know, I always mention drive through RPG. They make some cool maps and things that you can do. Um, but this is like, when I was, it has the same like, tickling of my brain that like a choose your own adventure books had or like the lone wolf and cub not lone wolf and cub i always say that the lone wolf books the uh steve jackson sorcery books and those other fighting fantasy style books this feels like a modern sort of adult version of that because you got to like build your terrain and and you know paint your characters and stuff and invest a little bit it's just really really fun and it's like just an easy way to kind of get that little D and D itch, you know, going on. And it's like I told you a few minutes ago in the video. I'm like, I don't know, leave me alone. It's fun. <laughs> like that's how I feel with this one. I'm like, yeah, whatever. It's I had an adventure. Cool. <laughs> just leave me alone. Like it's so freaking fun. It's just so good. So I apologize for not being a little smarter about that. But like I talk about the 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 event thing and everything, and it's definitely replayable. Uh, and as far as the other style of games like this, you know, I would say choose your adventure books or if there was such a thing as a solo D and D adventure, um, like I said, though, I would play this with my friends and, uh, if you know, just making time and stuff. Uh, yeah. So sweet. It's pretty cool. It's really, really cool. Uh, the different scenarios take mm, like an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. Just depends. Some of them are a little bit, I mean, it's elaborate setup. Like if you want to get down, and like be like i'm gonna build this like tower with like rooms and things like you can get down and make it a a project and so this that's the other part of this is it kind of scratches that hobby itch and the same with Frostgrave. uh the hobby side of it which i haven't talked really at all about uh in, in any of these videos is not to be undersold and that's a new thing i've discovered in the last couple of years it's like oh cool i made a world and uh, you know you built a little world and out of out of things and stuff like that. That's a fun thing to do. I don't know, whatever. That's awesome. <laughs> anyway, yep. Yeah, so that's number three. This is I'm getting kind of sick of this already. Um, number two is Kalis. This is was my number one last time I did this. Uh, I did a top 100 about five years ago. So this is my number two game of all time. And uh, I've blinged the heck out of this copy. This is an old one, it's all beat up. You can't even, see that cover? Like, I love that cover. Why do they use that stupid guy frowning now? Let's look at this guy, he's ready to build. He's ready to go. Uh, this is uh, one of the first worker placement euros. And uh, I love this game. And it's super mean. And it's super like thematic. So a lot of things I've mentioned over the last several videos. So yeah, it's work replacement, whatever, fine. But it's cool because this jerk, whoever he is, is trying to build this castle because he wants a big castle. I don't know why, who cares? He's a dork. He wants a castle. So all these contractors and things are coming to help him out build a castle. Right, it's money, right, it's a job. 
And that's that's where you come in. You're a subcontractor. You got these workers. You're sending them. You got to pay them when you when you put them on spaces because it's a worker placement game. Not just like I'm taking a thing and doing it. Like you got to pay your worker when you put them on this game. That's cool. That makes a lot of sense to me. And then you put him on the spot. You pay him, and then he does some things. And then maybe you go help build the castle. Maybe there was a side effect. This castle building. There's this little industry growing around this castle, and you start to build buildings. And you start to own the buildings. So like, hmm, this castle needs built. I think we need a good lawyer in town. So you build the law office. Or I think I need a good, uh, I don't remember the name of the building, like the residential building guy, whatever that's called. And then, you know, you need that. And then you need the new woodworker and the new uh, seamstress type place. And you need, there's, oh, we found a gold mine, you know, and I need some, some a jeweler to show up. And so uh, because of this castle, this thing, this sort of enigma, uh, this little town, a village, an economy, the people's lives. You can see it kind of grow across the board. And then you're in there, you're making money, you know, you get the workers, you know, you're doing things, you're trying to get the favor of the king. It gives you little bonuses when you do fun stuff for him. And you're trying to, maybe you try to be the castle guy. You know, on this turn, you try to, this game, you try to be the castle guy, you get a lot of points to get the castle. Or maybe you try to be like, uh, oh, I'm gonna take advantage of this. I can see this new town growing. I'm gonna get involved there. Get in, we're gonna build a big cathedral. Screw that castle. That castle's nothing. It's peanuts. Build some cathedrals and some big monuments and stuff. Yeah, that's a lot of points. <laughs> so you do all that stuff. Then you get the king's favor. He gives you, throws you little, you know, favors here and there. Super cutthroat. Uh, you've also got this little bailiff floating around in the game, and a sheriff, and uh, or sorry, provost. Bailiff and provost. So I call him a sheriff. And uh, you know what? If you move him a certain way down the track here. Yeah, uh, you can't do anything on your turn <laughs> uh, with that worker, uh, you know, because I, I bribe them. He, he's he's coming there to shut you down, yeah. Because uh, this is not uh, it's not all everything's not all as it seems in the happy town of Kalis. <laughs> yeah, so I love that. I absolutely love that part of the game because uh, it makes uh, money in this game is not like money in some euro games. It's not like money becomes this or. You know, wood becomes gold, becomes money, becomes points, you know, blah, 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 resource conversion. It's like, no, I need money to pay my workers. I need money to bribe people. <laughs> I need money for other things. You know, to uh, if I build a residential apartment, it, it, the, the, the people that live there, are gonna, they're going to pay me rent every, every uh, turn. So it feels like real. And, um, and I love the threat of that political bureaucrat in the game. That you were like trying to, uh, you deserve, like you can have massive negotiation about that. Well, if I move it up two spaces, you can pay him another two bucks. You can move him another two spaces, and Billy can't do anything this turn. <laughs> it's like, is it worth it? And Billy's like, no, it's not worth it <laughs> because you, I'm not going to forget that. And so, like, yeah, that is like, I love that. I love that because it's thematic. It's 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 mean. It's, uh, it's, it's elegant. It's, it's got, you can do fun little combo things the way that you sort of like everybody puts their workers out and then you're like, okay, now we run down the track and then you do all the stuff and then, uh, and then it happens. And then you score your points and build your stuff. If you can do it and away you go, uh, it's great. Absolutely. There's not another game really like this. So the other thing I need to talk about is player count. This game is horrible horrible at two players in my opinion every time i say that somebody comes out and says no you're dummy why do you have a youtube channel <laughs> I, I don't know i just do <laughs> i apologize two is horrible awful awful game it's best with three and four players absolute stellar all that stuff i was just being an idiot about three and four players beautiful five players mm, i still like it but you can't do some things. It like doesn't scale that well at five. It gets a little too tight, but I still like it. Like I would play it with five with people that have played it and like like the game. Like if you played five your first time, you might be like, that's kind of weird because they didn't get to do very much. You know, yeah, I, I got you. Three and four players, beautiful, it's perfect. Two players, whatever. Never, never will I play two players. I hate it. <laughs> This is my number two game. It was used to be my number one. Two players, awful. Burn the game. That sucks. Uh, five players, fine. Like, well, if you got some experienced players, then play with five players. 
Two players is too much zero sum. That's just r ridiculous. Um, so the game's gonna take you, mm, gosh. I played this a lot of times in my life since like 15 years ago. Um, I've seen games go three hours. Not so much anymore. Um, mostly that I think those plays were, you know, like 15 years ago or whatever, because it was kind of like a new mental concept to people. Cause we were like, what? You put a guy down and you do the thing a little bit later after everybody else is done placing guys. Ooh, I put the guy down in the wrong order. Uh, you know, so like, it's just a lot of things that like, if you play a lot of games, you know, you're like, Oh, work a placement. I got this, you know, like it's a kind of a second nature thing now. Uh, I would say now two hours, uh, you know, less or less. But if you play like five players, you could take two hours. Uh, what game did I have like this? Oh, uh, well, actually, The Godfather uh, from uh, Simon. Is that what they're called now? Come on, whatever the name. Cool me or not. <laughs> from Simon. Uh, that game kind of sort of reminds me of this because it's got a funky killer worker placement thing where you can like shoot and kill your other workers and send them into the river and it's got like a weird area control versus worker placement thing. Like it's super thematic to me, The Godfather from a cool minute or not. Uh, so if you like The Godfather, take a look at this. If you like this and you're like, The Godfather, no, that's cool minute or not, that's not gonna be very good. Take a look at it, it's pretty fun. Um, so yeah, I think that's about it about Kalis. So let's get to the, I'm gonna have to do an edit. Okay, we're back. Number one game, Warhammer Age of Sigmar, second edition. Uh, mm, gosh. So this game is sort of like taken over. Uh, so this is the core rule book. These are all the other rule books I have for some of my different armies. <laughs> These are some of the novels that I've read. Here's the other ones. there this is over the course of a few years so take it easy um yep i really enjoy this game obviously it's my number one now if you told me when i did my last top 100 list this wouldn't have been well there was no age of sigmar back then it was warhammer fantasy battle uh, so this wasn't really a thought in anybody's mind i really enjoy everything about this game i do i like the lore which is odd to me because I always thought it would be kind of, I don't know, like juvenile, and it kind of is, let's be honest. Um, really cool, interesting, magical, funky world of giant sort of undead living warriors that are brought back to life when they die, but lose a little bit of their soul when they die. They kind of lose a little bit of their personality when they die, or they change a little bit. And you got these little chaos guys that are kind of playing around with things, and you got little remnants of the old world, it's kind of like, uh, uh, Mid Midgard or uh, you know, whatever the Thor type of fantasy is kind of really high weird uh, High-level fantasy Different like planes of existence these different realms kind of like a magic the gathering uh, You know based on different elements and so like there's these different magical elemental cores that are Yeah, blah 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 blah, you know, like all that kind of weird lore stuff is actually pretty cool um, and just interesting and in the scope of a game makes it really fun to play like i don't know that although i've read some some of these books are really good um but you know i wouldn't be like well this is like game of thrones or dune or whatever you know like i don't know let's let's, let's be real about it but in terms of playing a game uh it's really neat to have all these different things that you can sort of wrap your head into and um just sort of just eat away a couple hours of fun uh, of having my army versus your army or whatever and you know or playing different smaller and larger scale battles of just you know a few, few people uh, and stuff like that and just you know having a little bit of narrative stuff but also the mechanics are really cool i played in some tournaments and things um, and uh, as far as like you know trying to pl play the game and execute uh, the battle plan and all that kind of stuff to the best of my ability it's really really dynamic that way so let's try to keep this on the rails. Mechanically, um, the thing that I love about this game, which I hated and I've heard other people hate, but then after I played it a while, I was like, this is great. This is what makes the game so good. Is you have this thing called a double turn, okay? So in this game, 
I do all my things. Let's say I go first. Do move my guys, cast my spells, shoot some stuff, maybe engage in some combat, you respond. Then you do your turn, move all your guys, activate your abilities. And then round one is over. We've both taken our turn. We're gonna roll for initiative. Let's say I lose. So you get to go, or you get to choose, but you can say, oh, I'm gonna go. Well, you just had your turn. You get to go again. Oh no, that's bad, that's terrible. <laughs> so the thing is, the threat of that, just that simple threat of, of if you're going first in a given turn, your opponent's going second, they may get to go again after that. So don't just like push all your stuff into the very center of the board, because you're gonna get jumped <laughs> you're gonna get ruined so that threat just makes the game brilliant I, I love it so much that stuff oh I don't know it's that's such a weird thing just that one mechanic I absolutely love okay so beyond that there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with your army obviously these these big mass scale battles games are about building synergies and you know and finding cool little combos and things and positional tactics and all this kind of stuff and responding and kind of knowing your opponent's army, knowing about their army, knowing you know, knowing the lore of their army is really neat. Not really important during the game, uh, but you know, knowing kind of what tricks and stuff they have up their sleeves, and and you know, pulling little combos off, and you know, just the measuring preciseness and all that kind of stuff. What that is just you know, like I said a couple years ago, I've been like, hmm, I don't know. You push models around and roll four hundred dice, like, <laughs> okay, yeah, but that it just is a very very engaging thing and i honestly encourage i know a lot of people start watching my videos for the euro games and stuff and they really like biting into strategy and all that stuff um it's, it's here it's in this it's you know there's a reason that the highest level competitive players rank at the top tables tournament after tournament yes it's dice rolling yes you roll probably 400 dice but guess what that does that evens out the odds pretty quickly once you start to roll a massive amount of dice um, yeah, so I don't know that there's really too much to say about this game. Like I kind of mentioned earlier, it's f it's fun. Like it's it's the hobby side of it. It's fun. The models that this company makes, Games Workshop, are amazing. Just being able to go and paint for hours on end and just craft something, and and then take that to the table and 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 play that against somebody that has crafted you know, their own thing and just play with a like-minded individual. That wasn't, doesn't always happen, but uh, you know, somebody that is able to get into a little bit of this lore, but also try to play, you know, to high level and try to make good tactical choices and, and be a friendly uh, person across the way is really a fun thing. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, this game is just bananas all over the place. And it's just one of those things that when they talk about it like a lifestyle game, I mean, there's a lot of games that you could call that. But to me, this is like the full on it because you got the painting, you got the hobby, you got the lore and the literature and all the different rules and things they come out with constantly. And uh, they're constantly like also as sort of a feather in its cap, uh, giving you new ways to play because you can play a large 2,000 point massive battle game on a six foot by four foot board. You can play a thousand point, or, or maybe less, but in my opinion, you don't really start to play the game until you get to a thousand points. You can play a thousand point game on a four by four table, maybe even a little smaller if you know if table space is, a, is an issue. But four by four table, you get a little slap or a board, throw a thousand points down, you can get in for a thousand points for reasonably cheap. I mean, about the price of an expensive Kickstarter game and not like an all in. I mean, you go all in, you could probably get one full 2000 point plus army. Um, uh, yeah, so you can play it different ways. You can play through like a Path to Glory campaign where you pick up like a start collecting box and you and a friend do that and you do that and build the models and play. And then everybody, you know, you each go get like another box of units for 30, 50 bucks or whatever next month, you know? And then you do that kind of stuff. And then after a few years, you're like, what about all this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, so yeah, so there's just a lot of ways that you can play and get into the game. Um, and sort of in narratively, there's a lot of ways to get in the game as well. Um, so yeah, so th there it is, you know, I've started doing battle reports. I did a handful last year. You'll see some more of this and kill team. Um, but there's something about the Sigmar stuff that, whew, gosh, I think I've already wasted enough people's time, but 
there's there's a there's a layer here of just the world and living in it and just kind of the that little sort of rock and rollish type of thing i don't know hard to say i like lots of different music too so just like i like a lot of different games <laughs> anyway so that's my that's my top top 50 and uh so that's it so i'm gonna just blab for a couple of minutes here and you can see i kind of struggled there at the end because uh, when something is like special to you, the last couple of games now, San Juan, Warhammer, Frostgrave, Kalis, you know, uh, when it's like, it's like I'm not trying to say this is the best game of all time. I don't give a crap about that. Like, I don't, I don't and I don't like ranking stuff. Uh, I just, it, it put things in order, and I kind of said this earlier, um, in the first video I said, when I sat down to do this, I, I had a moment, I was like, go, and I listed 40 games. And then I kind of ordered them a little bit, you know. But I just, the important part for me wasn't the ordering of that. It was the 40 games. So if you look at the top 40 of this series, the last this video and the last three, that's it. Like, they're all the same. They're all, like, they're, they're all awesome. Like, I'm thinking now, it just pops into like a vision. Defenders of the Realm. Yeah, that's awesome. Combat Commander Europe, also great. So like, why have one? Why have a number? Why have a number one? That doesn't make any sense to me. Because if I could, if I play Warhammer Age of Sigmar, and I go to a tournament and I play, you know, like a two-day tournament, and I'm like, whoa, I'm sick of that game. <laughs> you know, when I'm done, it's like, yeah, I don't want to play that for a while. <laughs> or we go and I play Shadows of Brimstone on a long Saturday. You know, I'm like, cool, got my fill, I'm good. Uh, tomorrow I'm gonna play San Juan. That's a fun, easy game, because that's gonna activate this this section of my brain, this little bald section, <laughs> and then the other one's gonna activate this section of my brain, or something. So, to me, the ordering is is there's so much like pretense and me trying to like sell you a YouTube video because I got what's the number one? Who's gonna win? Like, okay. Like, and I did this because it was a stretch goal. A lot of people ask me all the time. I did a Kickstarter that said, I said like 50 games. That's because in my heart, I knew 50 games is good. Like 50 games is enough. Seems to work out about 40 for me. Now it could change for different people. Uh, you know, some people hundred is good, but I'll get, I'm not going to completely bag on the top 100 idea here, but let me just kind of get through my, like my personal thing about this. And I think I've already kind of done that is those 40 games. Cause there's a reason I have a shelf of, you know, 150 games or whatever it is here it's because you know there's a lot of days in the year <laughs> and for me to go well this is my number one all that kind of stuff so yeah the ordering really bugs me and like awards sort of bug me like if you have awards like uh, and that kind of thing or like this tv show is the best tv show and that tv show shuh, sucks and this tv show is way better because of the character this and that blah 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 Gosh, enjoy life. <laughs> so, um, so that's where the ordering really bugs me. However, I just because I don't want to feel like I'm coming down. I'm, I just did a top fifty, so it would be really hypocritical of me to just be like a punk at the end of this. And you know, I wouldn't want any bad feelings about towards others. So, like one thing that helped me a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, when I was getting into the hobby more ferociously around 2010 and because I've been playing games for a while like 10 years and so but I was like you know I got bit or whatever by this bug and then you know Tom Bassel and them they well him he did a uh, top 100 video and I was like this is great because I don't care about the order what Tom number one game like I don't know I don't know Tom but I was like cool this is 100 games and I watched and I was like ooh, that one looks neat 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 and so I had a list of a few games and I was like, oh, let me check these out. Go watch a video review or read up a review on it and check out the pictures and see what it looks like. See if it looks cool. So I like these lists. So I don't, don't want you to like be like, oh, Joel, you did all the lists and you're being a bummer. <laughs> I'm not trying to be a bummer. I'm just saying the order bugs the crap out of me. <laughs> but I like the lists because if you're coming in and you're like, oh, I never heard of that game before. That looks neat. And this person here, you know, that was in their sort of their, their cream of the crop orb of games. Uh, so yeah, so I do, I do like the list. I just don't like the emphasis some people 
viewers, people that create the list, whoever is doing it or, or not doing it necessarily is putting on like, this one is the number one. What's his problem? Why was this number 20? That should have been number one, whatever, go away. <laughs> you know, like, okay. So that's how that works. Uh, so just a couple other notes um, to sort of oh, go over. Oh, one is there's a geek list of a geek list list here. And uh, if you want to go look at like a quick summary, if you're like, you just watch this video and you're like, what are the other things? You know, you'll see the geek list on Board Game Geek and you can see like a quick uh, two sentence blurb about each game. And then uh, let's see here. Um, so you can see uh, one interesting thing I noted about sort of like doing the gut way with this was I was, it seemed, I didn't intentionally do this, but after I was done, I was like, oh, it's like I've got one or two games from each of these kind of sort of sub genres and things like that. So that's why I kind of went back and when I did this to kind of mention other games, because I was like, well, that's a good game. But no, I'd rather play this game, you know, nine times out of 10, like Steam and Power Grid is the one that comes to my head. Like I'd rather play Steam than Power Grid, you know, most times, or, you know, Blackstone Fortress, which I talked about, uh, is, um, is is the is the uh, you know is the one I'd rather play. I like these other Warhammer Quest games just fine, but I'm like, oh no, let's play Blackstone Fortress. I don't want to play those others right now. Uh, so uh, by sort of just zeroing in and like just sort of sweating out the top forty, I'm like, oh well, I've got kind of one of you know from all these different places. So that might be why the list is a little bit more diverse uh, than than I don't know what than whatever the alternative is. Uh, because it just sort of like pushed, I just kind of pushed stuff out. I was like, you know, like I said, I was just like that one, that one, that one, that one. All games that I would like at that instant when I made the list a couple of months ago were like, these are the games I want to play today. And that's the other reason I sort of don't like the list a little bit is because it's like, Joel, this is your top 50. You're now locked in. But I guess what? Tomorrow is Saturday and it's going to be a different list. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow, my top 50 is going to change uh, because that's what happens in the world. Things just change and change and change and change. Uh, so that's about it. Uh, the other thing is, okay, oh, no lunch games because I don't play games at lunch at work anymore, which is a bummer. Uh, some people have left work. Some people have we've sort of moved across different teams. For a while there, we were all kind of on the same, I uh, work in software. We were all on the same software team. And so we've all, you know, you get kind of shuffled around at work. And so our schedules are all different and stuff. And uh, we were playing every day there for a while at lunch. And now it doesn't happen. So you don't really see too many lunch games on here, which is just also in indicative of my play environment. And I think that's also an important thing to realize with somebody's um, somebody's list like I think it's cool to say oh okay so you have a different lifestyle than me so our lists don't match up as opposed to like you're dumb dumb and you don't like the same games as me and it's like meanwhile well it's like maybe I would like that game but my world and my circle of friends is like doesn't involve that and so you look at Age of Sigmar and it's like a couple of years ago not a possibility recently for whatever reason that's the world I live in so I think these lists have more to do with that than actual good and bad and better and best. Like all art should, because there's no really ranking art. That bugs the crap out of me. <laughs> Just in case you got the picture of that. Um, um, yeah, and so the other thing I wanted to mention with that, two more things to mention, is also to, to think about with this list is my lifestyle is not that of a professional YouTube board game personality. Uh, ooh, I didn't mean to say personality. That feels negative. You know, uh, person. Um, so the amount of time I have to play games and, you know, like I said, the people that happen to be currently be my friends and all that stuff and the games my family likes to play too, like all of that uh, informs it. And... Yeah, it's something that I think I lose sight of, frankly, which is probably why it irritates me. But I, I think other people also lose sight of it is just that, again, that environment, the lifestyle and things that you have going through your day-to-day -day life. I go to work. This is a good outlet. There you go. So I don't spend all day, every day playing lots of games. That's a different mentality. Um, so there's that. I mean, it's just something to think about. I'm not really trying to say one thing or the other about it. But that's just something to keep in mind when you, you know, watch somebody's videos or read their reviews and just, you know, 
like you're going to intersect with them in some ways and not in others. That's that's the way of the world. Uh, not really sure, really sure what the point of that was, but uh, and then there's other things that I, I one thing I, three games I wanted to kind of make a quick mention of that I don't think I've talked about at all was Pandemic Legacy season one, season two, Gloomhaven, and Freedom: The Underground Railroad. Games that I do not have in the house anymore. Games that are amazing, which should probably be on the top 50 list, but for different reasons are not games. Well, Gloomhaven and Pandemic Legacy kind of finished them. Not Gloomhaven, I didn't finish that. But I was going to only finish it, so I need, I need to get rid of this because, you know, I like to play different games. Um, and Pandemic Legacy, I played season one and season two. Really enjoyed that. Really enjoyed Gloomhaven. And just those are weird. Like, it's like, uh, it's like because I had Unlock on here, but there's always going to be new Unlock games kind of refreshing it. Where there's going to be t Pandemic Legacy Season 3, but is there going to be a Season 4? Like, is that really going to be a game? So, again, that's not... I don't know. There's a weird... Like, I played it. I'm not going to play it again. It's fine. It was awesome. So I loved it. But, I don't know. This feels strange. Like, sentimentality is another thing that I don't really... I mean, I guess you could, you could say, well, Joel, you have Kalis, but I still love that. I'll play it now. But, like, just looking back and saying that Pandemic Legacy was good two years ago. Cool. Yeah. That was two years ago. I don't know who that person is. <laughs> uh, and then Freedom Underground Railroad is, uh, yeah, that's a good one, too. That game kind of uh, becomes a little bit of a bummer for me to play, so... Um, so I moved it on, but I highly recommend Freedom Underground Railroad. Definitely a uh, game everybody should play. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Kickstarter backers for helping with the new camera equipment and stuff. And we blew through the funding goal. And so it was fun to come up with some other things to do. And that's what this video series is, is, uh, is for in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, for anybody that wanted to see this, I get asked about it quite a bit. I um, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is uh, I think these lists are important, but I also think uh, it's important for you to make your own list. Um, I see people do it all the time. You don't need to be a YouTube person or have a, a review blog or anything. I would say make your own top 50 and uh, break it down. You know, throw out a list of games and then put them all on little cards and then randomly shuffle the cards and flip two games up and say, I like this one more than that one. And then just start doing that out and you have a big line of cards. And it, it's a... Uh, it, it's kind of a fun fun process to just do that and see the list and then forget about it <laughs> once you're done because then in three months or six months you're gonna have like five new games that are like screw these old games <laughs> I want to play these five new ones or whatever so but I think it's it's hard to explain why but I, it was good to go through the process for me and just kind of see stuff and see like you know, I don't need that game anymore. <laughs> I have this other game, that's fine. So it's good to kind of just do that and figure out certain things and or even like look and say to yourself, you know, I don't have any games of this kind of thing. That would be fun to maybe try that kind of thing. Um, I think that's, I don't know. Like I try to encourage that and I'm trying to, trying to encourage it in a way that's not condescending or anything or like whatever but like you got to try different games you got to try different things in life um you know i'm playing the miniature stuff now like whatever it's stupid but i don't know it's good like it's good to do different stuff uh like my wife always says to the kids this is all this is not a dress rehearsal right so there you go all righty Thanks, everybody. Have a good day, and I will see you at Gen Con or BGG Con, and uh, hopefully I can thank people in person for hanging out. All right.